Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm your host, Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to the third edition of our mini-sode series, TCSA Spotlight, where we discuss cases that are currently in the South African media. Before we get into the cases, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for the support that you have shown this show. I know I've said it a few times, but I really do appreciate the effort that every single one of you have made to listen, share, like, discuss, and invite your friends to listen. When I started this podcast two months ago, I could not have dreamt up the reaction it's had. And thanks to you, we're going to have a very exciting announcement to make in the next few days about an amazing opportunity that the show has been given. I'm itching to share the news with you, but I'll be a good girl and wait. Quite a few of you have mentioned that you'd like to hear some interviews, and that is something I'm going to be getting into very soon. I'll be interviewing a wide range of people with connections to true crime, both on the investigation side as well as forensics. I'll also be interviewing victims' families and survivors. If you have any suggestions for people that True Crime South Africa can interview, you're welcome to pop me a message on any of our social media forums or email me at wordsmith195 at gmail.com. I'll put that in the show notes too. In August in South Africa, we celebrated Women's Month, the public holiday we observe on the 9th of August, commemorates the day that 20,000 women marched to the Union Building in 1956 to present a petition to the then Prime Minister, J.G. Stradom, in a protest against the past laws which governed their movements at the time. The phrase, strike a woman, strike a rock, was developed during this march, and went on to describe the strength of South African women. 63 years later, Women's Month 2019 was commemorated with the senseless slaughter of far too many women. Megan Kramer, Uyinena Mwetiana, Lynette Falskink, Janika Malo, Leandra Yechels, and Jesse Hess were all viciously murdered in August. This is besides the numerous women whose name never made it to the media. Dr. Ntabaseng Maloko of the University of Stellenbosch stated that South Africa's rate of femicide is now five times higher than the global average. We also have the highest rate of rape in the world, with an estimated 138 rapes per 100,000 women in 2017. But these are just numbers. Shocking numbers, certainly. But they don't represent the pain and devastation that these events cause for the victims and their families. The knock-on effect is the trauma it causes in the community. Women live in fear, and men live in fear that the women in their lives will be next. On an average day, as a woman, if I really think about it, there are very few moments when I'm completely at ease. If I take my rubbish bin outside, I look outside the gate first to make sure there's no one hiding behind trees or walls. When I'm driving, all my belongings are hidden. My doors are locked, and any pedestrian walking too close to my car is a possible threat. When I go to the shop, I hold my bag closely and feel unsafe if someone walks too quickly up behind me. When I get back to my car, I make sure nothing's been fiddled with. And yes, sometimes I check my back seat. When I was younger and didn't have a vehicle, It was far worse, because then I had to walk everywhere. There wasn't a single day that I didn't get harassed on the street, and I am well aware that my fear is small compared to others. I started this podcast to help bring awareness to these cases, and I plan to continue doing that. If that is the small role I can play, although it is sadly after the fact, then I'm willing to stand up and do that. I know we all feel helpless. That's the worst part. 
we see all of this happening around us, and it feels like there's nothing we can do to stop it. The truth is that the surge in these types of crimes is a symptom of the breakdown of our society, and at the very base of that society is the family unit. Every perpetrator was once a child. Now I am well aware of the nature versus nurture argument, and I do believe that many offenders are born with antisocial behaviour traits that cause them to offend. But there is also a huge number that could avoid offending if their circumstances were different. I'm not talking about poverty here. I'm talking about growing up in a loving and supportive environment. I'm talking about teenagers having a support system. And I'm talking about young adults getting the help and guidance they need. If we consider this, then are we really that helpless? If all we do is ensure that the children in our own family unit are raised to respect human life, and that when they struggle, they are seen and helped, that is a small yet powerful contribution. If all we do is guide a wayward teenager and mentor them, that could change a multitude of lives. If all we do is refuse to accept our friend's claims that she walked into a wall again and keep pushing her to get help, it may stop the ripples in the pond of her family that her abuse will cause. These may seem to be small things, but if all we do is nothing, then nothing will ever change. Family units are changing and adapting to the way we live our lives, and the so-called nuclear family unit of two parents and children is no longer the absolute norm. That's not the problem. Single moms can raise well-adjusted children. Single dads can raise well-adjusted children. Same-sex couples can raise well-adjusted children. When things go wrong in any family unit, though, it is up to the community around that family not to turn a blind eye. Will there always be vicious and brutal murders in our country, and indeed the world? Yes, there will be. But they do not need to be at the overwhelming rate that they currently are. So that's my two cents on the matter. And now I'll get into some of the cases that came up in the media in the last few days. So probably one of the biggest updates we brought you last week was the sentencing of the last three members of Electus Perdias, whose series of 11 murders we covered in episode 4. The pre-sentencing hearing was quite the clown show, and a few interesting tidbits came out that weren't revealed during the trial. I discussed the concept of a pre-sentencing hearing in episode 7, but for those who haven't had a chance to listen to it yet, here's a recap. A pre-sentencing hearing is the portion of the trial which is held after the judge has made his or her ruling on the guilt or innocence of the accused person. Obviously, if they're found not guilty, they walk off into the wild blue yonder, and that's that. But if someone is found guilty of a crime, their defense team, as well as the prosecution team, are given an opportunity to present evidence in mitigation or aggravation of sentence. This will include victim impact statements, psychological evidence from either side, and character witnesses, amongst other things. Zach Valentine, Cecilia Stain, and Marcel Stain, no relation, had their hearings in the last few weeks. I've watched the footage of these hearings, and I thought I'd share some of the things that came up. Annette Fugier, a probation officer with 34 years' experience, addressed the court regarding her assessment of Cecilia Stain and Zach Valentine. Fakir also worked on high-profile cases, such as the Oscar Pistorius trial and the rape trial of Quieto Star Bricks. 
As part of her report, she assessed Zach Valentine's background and also spoke to his parents. She stated that Zach Valentine was born in Coltonville on the 3rd of August 1985 and raised in Western Area. Fakir determined that he had a stable home life with his parents and brother. Zach told Fakir that he felt that his parents were too overprotective and that this may have led to him being easily swayed by Cecilia. Honestly, I think that's a cheap shot. Because if his parents were neglectful, he would have probably said that caused it too. To be clear, Zach Valentine still denies that he was involved in any of the murders. He claims that all he did was give Cecilia money, which he believed was being used to fight Satanism, and he denies having anything to do with his wife's death. His educational qualifications were listed, and it was noted that he was a good student and never presented any behavioural issues while at school. He obtained his degree and then went to the UK for a year before coming back to South Africa to start a job at ABSA. His parents said that Zach had only known Michaela for five months before they got married. They said that he had become extremely isolated from everyone after he and Michaela met Cecilia, and that they do not believe he was involved in any of the murders, and they still support him, despite his conviction. I just want to take this opportunity to remind you that this is the same man who faked his own death and allowed his family to believe that he was dead for months. They were only advised that he was alive when he was arrested. Zach claims that he did not know that his death was going to be faked initially, and that he went into hiding when he got an SMS saying that Cecilia was getting money from his life insurance and he should go into hiding. Zach claims that he was afraid for his life, as well as the safety of his family, after what had happened to his wife, and this is why he went into hiding. I'm sorry, but I call bull on this. Zach made Cecilia the beneficiary of his life insurance. Why would he do that if he didn't know what they were going to do? Four of the other people testified to Zach's involvement in everything, including Michaela's murder, and the murder of Jared Jackson in order to fake his death. Marinda's testimony was worth very little, in my opinion, because it was constructed to get Cecilia and Marcel off. But even if we disregard her testimony, John Barnard, Larue Stain, and Marcel Stain all testified to Zach's involvement. This brings us back again to families standing by their loved ones after they commit criminal acts. We discussed this in the Hrikwistat murders, and it's still something I struggle to understand. I understand forgiveness. But actively supporting and assisting someone who has helped murder 11 people, including his own wife, and put you through hell by faking his death, goes beyond what I can understand. I would really like to delve into this issue. So if there are any listeners out there who've had the misfortune of having a loved one commit a crime this severe, you still, and you still play an active role in their lives, I'd really like to chat to you. I'm happy to make it an anonymous interview and I'll change any identifying details. I really just want to understand. You can make contact with me through all the usual social media channels or our website or email. Zach also told Fakir that he had been framed and that the media attention had caused him to not have a fair trial. His family had to stop coming to the trial because they claimed that the media was hounding them and that they started to experience a backlash from their community and at their places of work. Fakir then testified about the information she had gathered about Electus Padilla's mastermind, Cecilia Stain. Again, she looked at Cecilia's childhood, educational history, and she interviewed her parents and her ex-husband. Accounts of Cecilia's childhood differed substantially between her mother and father initially. Cecilia's mother 
initially admitted that there had been physical and emotional abuse in their household when her children were growing up, and the perpetrator had been her husband. Cecilia had alluded to an abuse of childhood in her own testimony, but had refused to elaborate. Cecilia's father completely denied the accusations, and, interestingly, later her mother changed her story and said that there was no abuse. Now, I don't really know what to make of this. Had Cecilia's mother initially been lying, in the hopes that it would help her daughter if she said she was abused? Or was she influenced by her husband into withdrawing this testimony? We know that Cecilia has DID, and that does not develop on its own. She suffered some sort of trauma in her formative years. We just don't know if it was at the hands of her father. Cecilia exhibited behavioural problems from an early age, and she was eventually expelled from school for drinking alcohol at a school function in grade 9. That was the highest level of education she would achieve. A very interesting new piece of information emerged when Fuchia stated that Cecilia had been married once before. In her early 20s, she had married an immigrant to assist him in gaining residence in South Africa. The marriage only lasted a few months and, according to Cecilia, was a business transaction. Well, yes, Cecilia. It's also an illegal business transaction, but we'll just gloss over that part. Her marriage to the father of her children was also, according to her, not born of love, but rather she wanted to have children and wished to do so in a safe and secure relationship. Let's be clear here, not that it matters, but it's pertinent to her relationship with her husband. Cecilia is homosexual. She is admitted to having lesbian relationships, and honestly, it seems as though she married her husband to use him because she wants her children. Another manipulation, and another victim of her narcissism. Or is he? Did Cecilia's husband know that she was simply using him as a sperm donor? Did he either agree to the arrangement, or was he perhaps so well manipulated by her that he thought that it was worth turning a blind eye to the fact that she had no intimate interest in him. The world has come very far, and many same-sex couples now have children of their own by surrogacy or IVF. She didn't need the fake marriage to achieve having children of her own. In my opinion, Cecilia knew that the types of religious community she was trying to infiltrate would frown on a same-sex relationship, and it would be far easier for her to portray the normal mom routine if she had the husband and white picket fence to go with it. Cecilia does not admit to her involvement in any of the crimes either. She claims that she's been framed, and her now ex-husband, as well as her parents, claim to believe this as well. Again, There is a mountain of evidence against her, and there is no way that it is all coincidence. Pachia stated that Cecilia had told her that she had started a new relationship with another inmate in jail. The inmate is apparently serving a 15-year sentence for murder. What a lovely couple. Pachia stated in the beginning of her testimony that Cecilia had asked her to ensure that her children's names were not read out in court. Apparently their names had been read out on a previous occasion, and they had been bullied and harassed. My feelings about Cecilia aside, I fully agree with her on this. There is absolutely no reason why her children should be identified. It is not their fault that their mother is Cecilia Stane, and they are going to have to deal with enough trauma from the knowledge of her crimes without their names being available in public record. When I discuss the children of either victims or perpetrators in my episodes, I will never mention their names, and I will only talk about them if it is relevant to the case. 
So Fakir makes this impassioned plea on behalf of Cecilia. And then later on, while she's reading her report into evidence, in a forehead-smacking loss of concentration, she read out Cecilia's daughter's full name and date of birth. She also tried to bring across to the court that she really thought Cecilia was a good mother. She said that Cecilia had only ever shown love and concern for her children, and that her ex-husband brought them regularly to visit her in prison. She went so far as to say that the children had performed well academically when Cecilia was living with them. Now, I would never want to refuse these children, who have already been through so much, the opportunity to have a relationship with their mother. But there are 11 victims who were someone's child. Many of them also had their own children. Those people don't get to see their parents or their children anymore, thanks to Cecilia. Probably the biggest bombshell that was dropped during Fakir's testimony was that Cecilia's parents had told her that they had been told that more people are going to be arrested for their involvement in the series. That's right, you heard correctly. Remember when I said in episode 4 that I had a feeling that there were more members of Electus Perdias out there and that we hadn't heard the end of this? Well, that just might be true. This has, of course, not been confirmed by the police, so I guess we'll have to wait and see. The prosecutor really climbed into Fakir, and the judge told her that he had sat in court with Cecilia for 37 full days, and he believed that she had manipulated Fakir. Two of the other witnesses testified regarding Marcel Stein. The first was Hanili Eskiapas the woman who had been Marcel's stepmother for a period during her childhood. Skiapas is divorced from Marcel's father now, but she says that when she heard on the news about the children and Marinda being arrested, she said to her current husband, There you go. She finally managed to totally destroy their lives. Referring to Marinda. She says that she initially made contact with LaRue through his friend. I will say that the friend whose name she mentioned is the journalist who I spoke about when I covered the case. The young lady who was accused of having an inappropriate relationship with LaRue, and the same young lady who has said she's writing a book about the Krugersdorp killings. Hanalee says that she visited LaRue and Marcel as she felt bad for both the children because she thinks that their mother was the cause of all their problems. Hanalee explained that she met the Stain children when she married their father, Andre Hugo, in 2003. At the time, LaRue was eight years old, and Marcel was six. Their parents had been divorced for two years by this time. She said that initially, they would see the children every second weekend and on school holidays. Hanalee described how Andre and Marinda would argue viciously almost every single time they saw each other to collect the children, so she had agreed to act as a go-between and collect the children and speak to Marinda on the phone when necessary. To explain how the fights had affected Marcel, Hanalee described an incident where she and Andre had gone to collect the children, and the argument between him and Marinda had become so violent that Marcel had wet herself. In describing Marinda's behaviour towards the children and her ex-husband, Hanalee told the court about an incident she had heard about when LaRue was eight months old. Marinda had left the child in the care of his father, only to return home and discover that Andre's sister had taken her baby to a local mall. Marinda had reportedly exploded and phoned the woman, accusing her of kidnapping her child. She had apparently barely been restrained from calling the police to report a kidnapping. Andre's family had refused to speak to Marinda from that day. Hanali said that Marinda had once told her that she had hated Andre Hugo from even before LaRue's birth, 
but she had stayed with him because her biological clock was ticking and she wanted children. Well, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Mirinda was described as overprotective where the children were concerned, but I think that a more appropriate word would be controlling. Mirinda allegedly also tried to sow seeds of discontent into Hanali's marriage by having strange women phone her and say that they were having affairs with Andre. Hanali said that she knew this couldn't be true because she and Andre spent almost all their time together and the cell phone number she was phoned on was only given to a few people, including Mirinda. In 2008, Hanali says that Marinda's controlling behaviour came to a head when the children started talking about a new church that they had joined and behaving strangely. She said that they had once given Marcel some new clothing and she had thrown some of these items into the dustbin because she feared that they would invite demons into her life. Leroux had to get rid of his toy soldiers for the same reason. The children were no longer allowed to watch television and could only watch selected movies. This, of course, coincided with Cecilia coming into their lives, but Hanley did not know this at the time. Marinda started making it extremely difficult for Andre to see his children and would give them very short notice in cancelling arrangements. It was on one of these occasions when Hanley claimed that she was about to leave to fetch the children and Marinda had called to cancel. Andrea had taken the phone, and a vicious argument ensued. Andrea had told Marinda that he could no longer take her manipulation, and that if she was going to continue to behave in that manner, he no longer wanted to see his children. Now, while it does bother me that he said this, I tend to think that it was simply said in anger, and after many years of having to deal with his ex-wife's manipulative behaviour, he snapped. Marinda seemed to very quickly grab onto this, though, and immediately told her children that their father no longer wished to have contact with them. She told them about dozens of extramarital affairs that she claimed he had had while they were married, and then told Marcel that her father didn't believe she was his child. It is alleged that the narrative of their father hating them was drilled into the children's head throughout the rest of their childhood. This, of course, is not uncommon in cases where marriage ends badly and children are involved. Parents will often use the children as pawns to hurt their partner, and when the non-custodial partner does not have contact with the children, it is probably often built up in the child's mind that the other parent wants nothing to do with them. In this case, however, we know that Marinda was involved in something quite different and I have no doubt that she orchestrated the split in order to further isolate the children into Cecilia's world. Hanali also went to see Marinda in prison, and said that Marinda had been obsessed with the term serial killer. She allegedly told Hanali that the mass shooter in New Zealand, who had killed close to 40 people in a mosque, made her look like a child. Hanali ended her testimony, by saying that if Marcel was released from jail, she would be more than welcome to live with her and her family. The second person to testify regarding Marcel was an educational and counselling psychologist called Rosalind McNabb. She works in private practice in Bedford View and has 19 years' experience. McNabb interviewed Marcel in person for nine hours in total. She also spoke to several people involved in Marcel's life and upbringing, including teachers and her father. McNabb administered three different psychological tests on Marcel, which were assessed by an independent organisation. These tests looked for personality disorders and any hints of psychopathy. They also tested her emotional reaction to certain situations to judge whether it was appropriate or not. McNabb told the court that when Marcel's parents had divorced at the age of four, she had felt that she was responsible for the divorce and she'd been taken to see a psychologist after developing anorexia. 
two years after her parents divorced, Marinda had reportedly married a man called Marcus Kukumur. This is the first that I've heard of this man, although I may have missed the mention of this marriage in the initial trial. Marcel says that the marriage was initially happy, but Marinda started to have arguments with Kukumur's daughter. Marcel says that this was the first time she saw her mother be physically violent towards anyone when, in a fit of rage, she had sat on top of Kukumur's daughter. This marriage did not last very long, and Marcel says that after the divorce, Marinda legally changed her surname, as well as that of the children, back to Stain, which was her maiden surname. When Marcel was 10, the family met Cecilia Stain, and she recalls their lives being very different after that. They moved many times to get closer to Cecilia, and eventually ended up in the same block of flats as her. At the age of 13, Marcel claims that her mother had told her that Cecilia had fallen ill, and that Marcel needed to move in with her for a while to help with her care. This became a permanent arrangement, and when she asked if she could move back in with her mother, she was told she could not, and she would be staying with Cecilia. Marcel says that she was essentially a housekeeper in Cecilia's home. She had to look after Cecilia's children, assist Cecilia with her health care, and cook meals and wash dishes. It is claimed that the narrative of the orphanage that Cecilia claimed to run was ongoing and used to control her actions. She would, for instance, be told that she could not have any friends or boyfriends because they would bring demons into the house and all the orphans would die. Despite being forced to live with Cecilia, Marcel says that she became obsessed with the woman and idolised her. She tried to imitate her in everything she did. Marcel told McNabb that at the age of 14, she had started using the street drugs cat and took, but she claims that she could control her use of these drugs, as she would stop using them when she had to write exams. She did not consider herself a drug addict. I will note here that 14 is also the age at which Marcel admitted to being involved in the murder of Michaela Valentine. I don't think that is a coincidence. She said that the only time she could recall feeling safe in her life was when she was with her father. This is very interesting, because when LaRue was asked how he felt about going to jail, he said that he didn't mind, because he felt safe there. As much as these two people may have manipulative skills, I do believe that their childhoods were spent constantly looking over their shoulders and fearing the one person who was supposed to protect them, their mother. Marcel noted that she attended four different high schools. I know that they were moving around a lot, but it was basically all within the same area, so in my mind, there shouldn't really have been a reason to change her schools. I may be reaching here, but I wonder if this wasn't done to stop her from forming relationships if students and teachers at a school only knew her for a grade or two before she moved again, it would have been difficult to pick up if anything was wrong. It is reported that a teacher had noticed that Marcel was losing a lot of weight when she started using drugs, and she had confronted her. Marcel had reportedly convinced the teacher that there was nothing wrong. As the judge would say in his sentencing, that would have been an ideal opportunity for Marcel to stop the madness and tell her teacher what was happening, but she didn't. Marcel told McNabb that she had tried to suggest to Miranda and Cecilia that instead of killing people, they could just rob them, but she was instantly shut down and told that she had doubting demons. Essentially, Marcel claims that she was made to believe that they were in a war against Satanists, and that the murders were necessary in order to get money for Cecilia's orphanage so that they could win the war. The assessments that were done of Marcel suggested that she may be suffering from bipolar disorder, 
but without psychotic features, so her type of disorder would not cause her to be violent. McNabb discovered that Marcel has features of obsessive-compulsive disorder with an avoidant personality. So she would be far more likely to avoid conflict than embrace it. McNabb described Marcel as a passive person who would develop the ability to disassociate from situations that caused her great stress. She says that this explains why she was able to quite calmly relate the events of the murders in court without sounding emotional. McNabb also claims that this is how she managed to pass her matric exams with flying colours, despite being involved in a murderous cult. Now, I do understand that disassociation is a tool used by the human brain to protect you from trauma, but I find it very dangerous that a person as young as Marcel has the ability to disassociate so effectively at will. Two other interesting things that came up while the pre-sentencing hearing was underway was that Marcel was caught shoplifting in 2016. Among the items she stole was medicine for Cecilia and baby items, which she said was for Cecilia's orphanage. The store she stole from did not press charges, and she ended up paying a 400 rand fine to get out of it. The other interesting thing was that Masal asked her counsel to place on record that there was no lull in criminal activity by the group between 2012 and 2015. Marcel says that they were planning further murders and other crimes during that period and got very close to committing them, but for one reason or another, all of their plans fell through. Just think about that for a minute. That's three years of planning. Who dodged a bullet in that time? Was it you? Was it your neighbor or friend? Scary stuff. On a lighter note, I did have a good giggle when McNabb accidentally called the judge my love instead of my lord. Okay, so that was more like a second episode of Krugerstorp Killers than a Spotlight minisode, but there was just too much interesting stuff to share. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, please remember to follow us on the podcatcher you use and to add us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Transcripts of every episode are uploaded to our website at truecrimesouthafrica.com. Please keep sharing our episodes and invite your friends to listen. I really appreciate your support. I'll chat to you in our next episode. 